that gets us next to uh, uh, the ADU issue, which I think came back to us by committee. It's item number 96. Also will serve as the uh, uh, public hearing. So I'm asking uh, legal, can uh, if this comes back to us from a uh, committee, we would have four people speaking for it and four people speaking against it. Are we allowed to hold a public hearing in accord with that rule? Um, I, I, I believe so, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, we can verify that. So, Mayor and Council, this is yes. a, an amendment to our zoning regulations, and not unlike where you have a a map change, uh, it would require uh, a public hearing to be held. Um, Ordinarily, so we limit those hearings to three minutes, so we impose restrictions. You, you, uh, you could reduce the amount of time, certainly. And that's what we've done here. So, unless there are objections, we're going to call four people for and four people against. Ms. Tobo. I did have a I did have a question from someone earlier today as to whether in a in a required public hearing whether we can limit the number of speakers I, and I know we did touch on this at one of our work sessions but there was a question about whether while the council had the ability to limit the amount of time for each of those speakers whether we could actually limit the number of speakers on a required public hearing under state law we're going to go ahead and, and I would ask the legal to look at this so that we know going forward we have nine speakers so I'm going to call nine speakers instead of eight and everyone will get two minutes in order to be able to speak recognizing that this is a matter that we're not going to we're going to handle on first reading only today uh, because we really want the committee to go back and consider this more in depth yes and mr. mayor I yes. would I would emphasize that we will um, be it's my intention if the committee members agree to allow for there to be continued public comments and conversation as we uh, on the particular items that we're discussing in each of those committee meetings. So the next, we'll go over it later, but the next committee meeting in August, there will be particular pieces of ADUs that we'll go over and we'll make sure we take public comment on that. So I think public voices will be uh, most effective on those uh, in those committee hearings uh, and that we won't be shutting those out to public comments in August or, or September, at least that will be my recommendation to my committee members. And as I recall, the model that you're following, this is what we did with the taxi cabs, and those were very exhaustive and long hearings, and when they came back to the council, they were the more limited uh, discussion at that point. So we would urge everybody to do work at the committee level, as um, Ms. Uh, Kitchen and the Mobility Committee did on that issue. So let me call then the uh, people to speak. Is Stuart Hirsch here? Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes. may I ask a quick question as we proceed? Yes. Just for clarification purposes, we have two items, 96 and 108. And for those of us who have not been as deeply involved, could you just explain? They're both on ADUs. So we're having a hearing on 108, not on 96. Is that correct? I've called both items. Okay. I think they're both items. I mean, it's the same item. Uh, but it requires a public hearing for one, and then there's the issue itself. So we're calling okay. both those up at the same time. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, first speaker is Stuart Hirsch. You have two minutes. Mayor and members of the City Council, my name is Stuart Harry Hirsch, and like most in Austin, I rent. And out of respect for uh, not using acronyms, I will refer to these as two homes on one lot uh, because that's what they are. Uh, I'm asking you to take nine actions that are now part of the backup, and I know this is first reading only and you're seeing this for the first time, but I think there's a lot of things that our neighbors have said that we need to listen to, and a lot of, the, a lot of things that those of us who may, uh, who may rent, who are part of the majority, uh, need to have happen to make eight accessory dwelling units or two homes on one lot more accessible for us. Uh, I've given you a copy of Ordinance 2008031-132 that currently allows increased impervious cover and perhaps flooding in the name of housing affordability, and I'm asking you to repeal that. I'm asking uh, that the new uh, two homes on one lot comply with applicable ordinances, uh, and they also comply with subdivision plat notes, private deed restrictions, and restrictive covenants that they never be allowed on former landfill sites or in the floodplain. 
that they never be allowed to be uh, short-term rental uh, because we're trying to increase supply and it makes no sense to take the supply out of the marketplace. I'm asking you to expand the zoning categories in which this is allowed uh, to include single family two, single family three, single family five, single family six, multifamily, mixed use, and transitory and development. I'm asking you to look into the water submeter issue, which is not part of the staff or commission recommendation, because I believe that the current policy is in violation of ordinance 20071129-100, which requires an affordability impact statement before uh, any change to rule or ordinance occurs that impacts affordable housing, and I cannot find any evidence that one was done when they stopped disallowing uh, people to tie in and you can see the square footage requirements there. I know we'll take this up later in committee and in full council, I'm happy to answer any questions about my proposal that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you'll engage in that committee level, it'll be important. Yes, sir. Thank you. Next speaker is Mary Engel. Good afternoon, um, Mayor and Council Members and Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of, I'm Mary Engel, and I'm here to speak in favor of the Planning Commission's recommendation for accessory dwelling units, or they could be called a disaster unfolding if you wanted to do the acronym another way. Um, this Planning Commission's recommendation is reasonable and sensible, and there's nothing wrong with reasonable and sensible. Um, there have been regulations that have been loosened so that these can actually give property owners other options and they might be able to build them more accessibly. The real reason that ADUs have not been built is it's about money. The funding isn't available. So as, as with all things, this is something that an ordinance or a, an amendment from the city council can't correct. Um, we have to be creative as a community to find funding resources for people to be able to build accessory dwelling units. Before any, any lot smaller than 7,000 square feet can be eligible for secondary units, the city's neighborhood planning department needs to revisit with the existing neighborhood plans about this infill tool because these were pre, um, these are these were prearranged agreements with neighborhoods and neighborhood contact areas, contact teams, and this is a way of actually promoting trust with city processes if we go back and have the planning department contact these uh, neighborhood plans to see if they want to opt into this infill tool for small lots. Um, I just will reiterate, I think that the Planning Commission's recommendation is very sensible and reasonable and I encourage you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Good timing. <laughs> Joyce. Bashiano. David King is on deck. Good afternoon. Mayor Adler and council members, my name is Joyce Bassiano. The Planning Commission recommendations for accessory dwelling units on single family zone lots greater than 7,000 feet and on lots in neighborhoods that adopted that particular planning tool are reasonable and as Mary just said, very sensible. These recommendations leave the other provisions of 25-2-774, the two family residential use and 25-214-1463 secondary apartment dwell regulations unchanged, which is also reasonable. The last city council was criticized for approving ad hoc amendments to the land development code. In fact, the code next consultant, Opticos, listed ad hoc amendments as one of the problems that has led to the code rewrite. Before expanding ADUs to lots less than 7,000 square feet, we need to carefully consider all the implications for the community. That's what the public understands the code next process is for. Please consider further changes to the ADU ordinance in the context of all the changes to the code as a part of the code next process. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mayor Tisdale is on deck. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. Yeah, I'm here to speak in support of, my name is David King, I live in the Zilker neighborhood, and I'm here to speak in support of the Planning Commission uh, recommendations for accessory dwelling units. Um, I think that's a good balance between, uh, uh, you know, loosening some of the rules in a way that does not really create a lot of negative uh, side effects that are unintended. So I think it's a it's a reasonable balance, and I and I support them. Particularly, uh, in, you know, uh, in my neighborhood, I have one ADU that I've seen uh, listed uh, as a short-term rental for $1,500 a night. So I'm very concerned that 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 they will be used not for affordable housing, but for these very expensive short-term rental purposes. And I think that's, that's a commercial short-term rental purposes. I think that's the problem. Um, you know, I do think that more work needs to do, be done, but I think that we should move forward with this, this, these recommendations. I think we do know, need to address the second water tap requirement. That, that seems onerous and, and unnecessary, and there are other low, less expensive ways to deal with that. And I agree that, you know, I think it's important that we do not in, allow an increase in the impervious cover for any purpose. In, in our urban neighborhoods, particularly, we already know that we have flooding problems from uh, that have been exacerbated by so much more impervious cover that's being built in our urban neighborhoods over the last decade. And not only that, they cause a heat island effect. And other cities like Dallas and Houston are already implementing strategies to address heat in their urban core. And they're having to backtrack now and try to come back in and deal with that through green infrastructure strategies after the fact. We should not be going the other direction. We should be dealing with that right now by not increasing the impervious cover limit. Uh, and they should not be built in, allowed to be built in floodplains either. I think that's a very good point. Uh, and I don't think we should expand them to allow them in substandard lots. In, in one size fits all concerns me where we just, they should be, the neighborhood should be allowed to have input on how these uh, ADU uh, accessory dwelling units are allowed in their own neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Eric on deck. Eric Goff's on deck. Ward Tisdale speaking. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members. I'm Ward Tisdale. And this thing keeps moving. Uh, President of the Real Estate Council of Austin. Uh, I'm here to represent our, our main platform, which is affordability in this community. Uh, Mayor, I think you, you share uh, many of our goals on that, which is to create 100,000 un units in the next 10 years. We have a housing supply crisis. It's pretty clear. We have a lot of demand, a lot of people moving here, but we also have a lot of regulations in opposition to, to growth uh, that has created this situation in the first place and which is why we're here today. Um, this to me is low-hanging fruit. Uh, this was a right that most residents had in this community years ago, but years and years of regulations have been added on to make the building of ADUs not only not possible, but, but expensive and just not doable. Therefore, we've not had the supply meet, meet the demand. Is this going to fix our housing crisis? Absolutely not. But as a piece of the puzzle, it's a simple thing. The regulations that have been layered on uh, were not your fault. Those were previous city councils, but you now have the opportunity to change that and to come up with solutions that will benefit uh, the citizens of this community. As a homeowner, I should have the right to do this. And we need to make those, those uh, regulations reasonable. I'm glad Eric's coming up next because he's got a more detailed analysis of what we need. But I, I ask that you come up with a reasonable solution and that you do it in a timely manner. I, I will note that this was, uh, I think a year ago, we were supposed, to, the council was supposed to come up with a way to make this citywide, and it's now a year later. Time is not on our side. Every minute that we wait, rents and home prices go up. So I would encourage you to act and act quickly, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. I understand, Mr. Tisdale, that where we've been before, that we've entered into a process here whereby what's being proposed is this gets considered on first reading only, right. and then it's going to go back to the, uh, to the committee in two tranches, uh, two different levels of issues then to be resolved with the goal to having this thing up and down all issues here uh, in, in basically the next two meetings of the planning group.
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, sir. Hi, I'm Eric Goff from Aura, a grassroots group that calls for an Austin for everyone. We stand with the more than 900 Austinites who have signed our petition for liberalizing backyard cottage rules. The 57% of Austinites who said to Zandon pollsters that they want to loosen restrictions on new infill development like, like backyard cottages, and the more than 70% of Austin Business Journal readers who support Aura's call to action in an online poll. The item before you today uh, is working its way through the city's legislative process for more than a year. The proposal you have before you is recommended by the Planning Commission, appointed by the previous council, is a first step, but is not sufficient. To quote my friend Dan Keshet, this milk toast PC recommendation is fiddling while Austin rents burns. We have a housing crisis in Austin, and today this council can take a first step towards addressing it. As outlined in our recent report, ADU City, we have the potential to get 500 new units a year if this council is bold enough to adopt a comprehensive ordinance, one that entitles all lots in Austin to build a backyard cottage, one that lets homeowners place a backyard cottage anywhere permitted by the residential building codes, one that offers financing assistance for low-income homeowners to build a market-rate backyard cottage, one that offers incentives to homeowners to build a new below-market-rate units, and one that creates a preservation bonus to let homeowners make use of their backyards without tearing down the main house. The report found that existing granny flats are already at 80% MFI affordable. Uh, housing that is market rate affordable needs to be embraced to tackle our housing crisis. Our report highlights families like Jesse Alvarados, who raised six children in a small East Austin house that built an ADU for him and his wife to allow one of his daughters to move back home in the neighborhood she grew up with to raise her daughter. Our report shows how to build thousands of new affordable homes in the next few years in Central Austin that can fight traffic, build a better local economy, and, make, and help people afford to live in Austin. The biggest topic of the 10 election was affordability, and this item is your chance to make a big difference for our city's future. Thank you. Thank you. Ricky Hennessy. And He's then, not here. Okay. Susan Moffat. And then Ross Smith. Take your time. I see the problem with this mic. I'm Susan Moffat. Um, six key points quickly. I'm speaking in favor of the Planning Commission recommendation. One, when you loosen development regs, you're expanding development rights for some. So there must be a clear public benefit in return. That's why the resulting rental ADUs must provide housing for residents not be taken off the market as type two short-term rentals. Even if you ban type twos, the code as currently written would still allow any or all of the new units to become permanent short-term rentals. So we need to fix this or we could wind up with no new housing at all. Two, as we heard at Planning Commission, the financial realities are that virtually all new ADUs will rent at market rates. To put a face on this, the city right now lists 1,500 employees of its own making under 50% MFI or below 26,300 per year. So reality check, the new units we're talking about will not be affordable to these employees or to musicians, hospitality workers, or other low wage earners. Studies do show slightly lower, lower rents for ADUs but they are existing older units, not ones built under current market conditions. And if we are banking on increased supply to bring down rents, which it may well could, we can move that ball faster by phasing out existing type 2 STRs. Three, please develop pre-approved plans for ADUs and allow, allow sub-metering, which could potentially save $20,000 or more per unit in construction costs. Four, please support Planning Commission's recommendation to keep one on-site parking spot for ADUs in the urban core, especially in congested areas near schools or businesses. You might be able to reduce parking on a more targeted basis, but if this is a blanket ordinance, we must err on the side of public safety. Five, please tie any further relaxation of ADU regs to the creation of permanent, deeply affordable housing for residents 50 to 60 percent MFI or below. We know this can't be achieved by regular homeowners, but there are experienced affordable non-profit housing. Fun. Housing nonprofits who can re help, so please reach out to them. And finally, please initiate a citywide study on flooding and infrastructure impacts, looking at current and projected impervious cover and number of units to ensure safe planning as we grow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ross Smith. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm in favor of more accessory units. I lived in a garage apartment when I was a baby. I don't remember it, but I did. Um, and they were the affordable housing of my youth. 
this all comes down to parking. Parking on the street, parking on the, on the lot. Parking is bad in, this, in our neighborhoods and it's getting worse, but it's gonna keep getting worse whether you allow more affordable unit, more accessory units or not. And so I'd like to suggest a workaround, which is a variance where the, uh, the owner of the lot would be allowed to build a secondary unit as long as they accept a requirement that they are not allowed to rent to someone who owns a car. We have a lot of, we, we keep hearing about young people who are moving into our downtown area who don't have cars, don't want cars, they use Uber, they use car to go they just don't want, they, they know how to live without using cars. And we are getting to be a big enough city that that is possible. A variance that would allow a homeowner to add the secondary unit as long as they didn't rent to someone with a car would take care of the parking problem. And it would be the homeowner's option to accept that restriction or not. Um, that's something that the, the city legal department and the planning department I think should take a look at because it might be a, it might be a way to deal with the parking issue f going forward because no matter what you do, it's gonna keep coming up and coming up and coming back to you. Thank you. Further discussion on this issue? Mayor. Yes. I'd like to move on first reading the Planning Commission's recommendation. It's been moved on first reading. We approve. Um, do we want to close public hearing subject to being reopened? Yes, sir. And public hearing is closed subject to being reopened. Um, is there a second to that motion? Mr. Renteria. Ms. Tobo. So if we close the public hearing subject to being reopened, then it appears in the agenda as closed, and I'm concerned that we'll get back into the problem we got back, we had a little earlier, um, a few months ago when we had an agenda with a closed public hearing that had been broadcast to the public. So I guess I would just wonder whether we want to actually close the public hearing or just keep it open. Or do we want it identified somehow that it's limited so that people at least knew we would be doing the same kind of thing? There was a lot of work, I think, that Ms. Kitchen did with the various stakeholder groups so that people arrived not having an expectation that there would be a full-blown uh, uh, open meeting. So I'm concerned about not creating an expectation either way. I don't want people not to show up, but I don't want them to show up thinking it's a wide-open hearing either. So maybe it just needs to be as it comes back from the committee, assuming that the committee's made changes. If the committee hasn't made any changes, then we don't need to do it anymore. But if the committee um, makes changes, then there might be some discussion. I, I do think it's um, one of the things that we've talked about adding to agenda is to make it clear on the agenda when something's coming back from the committee that it's limited to eight uh, speakers. So perhaps we can work with the um, agenda office to make sure that language gets on the agenda. Oh, the, the specific agenda language that, you know, that clarifies that um, because it's been heard in um, in a committee that is limited to eight. We can ask the agenda clerk yeah. to do just that. Yes. Mr. Mayor, uh, Robin Harris with the Law Department. This is, if you remember from the work session, uh, Ms. Morgan discussed public hearings and, and some of those that are required, and this is one of those required public hearings. You can close this public hearing and still allow public comment at, at some point in the future on, on this other item that comes up. But if, we, if, if we're resetting it as a public hearing later, it has to be posted to set the public hearing and then have the public hearing set at, at, at another time. Okay. I think the intent is to close the public hearing, but when we post this for the agenda, we'll make clear that public comment will be taken, but that it will be limited public content consistent with our rules. And we'll have the Jeanette do that for us. Ms. Houston. And I have a question, uh, Mayor, for the committee. When you heard this in committee, was it posted as a public hearing? Public hearing or public comment? I, I don't know, I'm asking because, because uh, you know, some of our citizens are just getting used to the committee structure, so if it wasn't posted, because I'm getting emails just now about issues concerning um, 
uh, the accessory dwelling unit. So I'm wondering how it was posted on the committee so that if people knew that they could come and talk at that point, or was it just said public comment? I, I think it was posted like any other item on the agenda that people are entitled to speak on any item on agenda, but the, the chair might address that. Yes, it was, it was posted just like all the other items on our agenda, but what I will ask to make clear is that uh, for our committee meeting in August, that it make be very clear that public comments will be taken at that meeting in August, that public comment will be taken at the meeting in September, and that um, that any recommendation that we send back, there will be an item posted from committee, um, and then we, and we can make sure that it says that we will be taking pu public comment on any recommendations taken from the item. I still don't committee. know what the language was for the prior committee meeting so that people knew that they could come and give testimony about this. It was, it was listed under uh, the regular section for uh, action items and for consideration, just like all the other items on our on that committee agenda. Similar uh, to how we post council items that people talk to. But what we should, and we had a couple of people comment that there were some items in there that we had heard in a committee meeting beforehand where we didn't have public comment. And as you heard probably in the work session on the transition committee, we're working to clarify that. But yeah. the fact of the matter is, um, if they missed that chance, there will still be a chance in August to talk through about half of the ADU issues and another chance in September and two more council meetings. So if they yeah. missed that one chance, there are still, as far as I can count them, up to up to four. Um, we will be, of course, limiting those so that they're, we don't take another two hours those four times. But we did have about two hours worth of public comment on ADUs at the committee hearing. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I, th I think that um, the concern that Council Member Houston is raising, I, th I think we're hearing that concern and, and we will work on getting standard language on agendas to make it clear for people when they can come and speak. Okay, Mr. Zimmerman. Mr. Mayor, I, well, if I get a second, I'd, or if I need a second, I'd like to divide this question. I'm not comfortable about the first reading and the hearing being closed at the same time. Can I divide those, that question and have us vote on that separately? Closing the hearing being one thing and then approving on I'm first reading. I'm gonna let you go ahead. The motion was made to close the approve on first reading and close the public hearing. I'd like to divide you the question. amend that to take out closing well, the public hearing? Okay, yeah, we're just dividing we'll the question either way. We can move to, to change the resolution so as to not close the uh, public hearing. Is there a second to that? I'd second that motion. Ms. Houston seconds. Any discussion on that item? The, the reason I'm seconding that motion is because I'm not sure that everybody was clear uh, for the first public, I mean, for the first committee meeting. And uh, so I just want to make sure that if we're going to change but something between now and then, the next time that people have an opportunity to speak, because it sounds like the committee will be bringing back another section of something that we're already passing on first reading without having the opportunity to have public hearing on that first option that we're getting tonight. So I'll be voting for that. Mr. Kassar. To clarify here, I'll, I'll lay out briefly the topics that I want discussed in August and September because I don't think any will be left out. Um, and so, here, let me see where I put that piece of paper. I'll try to do it from memory since I have too much paper stacked up in front of me. In the August committee meeting, uh, right now we have, we are intending to talk about uh, pre-approved design plans for ADUs, the possibility of uh, financing for lower income homeowners for an ADU, uh, utilizing uh, ADUs and those regulations around ADUs to prevent teardowns. The water submetering issue will likely be heard at that August committee meeting, but I'll be co coordinating with the Public Utilities Committee and STR's uh, regulation on ADUs. And then in September, we will talk about parking and driveway requirements, lot size requirements, neighborhood opt-in and opt-out and affordability requirements in September. And so I don't, as far as I can tell, that pretty much touches on the entirety of the ADU question just split into two meetings. And so anybody who didn't come and talk at our last committee meeting about ADUs, uh, I'm pretty sure that almost any topic um, that they're interested in could be addressed either in the August or in the September meeting. But if we want to 
move to keep the public hearing open, that's fine. I just think that it's a state regulate, you know, it's a, the public hearing has a, a, a specific definition, but we are certainly taking a lot more public comments on this issue. So it, it's up to the pleasure of the council, but I think we are gonna have lots of opportunity for people to speak. I'm gonna vote against the, the amendment because I think the model that we used with the taxi cab worked well. As you recall, there were several times here we had a room full of people, uh, 100 people or more probably, uh, but we worked out a solution that was, uh, that seemed to work work well. Uh, I had some concern about uh, Mr. Kassar bringing this issue up this way in pieces uh, because I was, I was concerned that we would have that opportunity. We were, rather than saying to the committee, go away and do, do all of the work and then come back and then we could do it all at once, uh, I, 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 um, um, I agreed to, to move forward with Mr. Kassar arguing that this gave greater visibility to the issue uh, to people because it would be coming back and leaving and coming back and leaving and people would know when different parts of it were going to be discussed. Um, so I would want the public hearing closed, recognizing that as a group uh, we can take public comment. It looks like it's coming back to us on two more occasions uh, and I trust our ability to be able to fashion a, uh, a comment period that's appropriate for the moment, taking into account the number of people and taking into account uh, what it is that, what changes, if any, have been made. Further debate on the uh, amendment from Mr. Zimmerman. Mr. Zimmerman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I was part of that mobility uh, committee discussion on the taxi cab franchises. I, I think the difference here is this, this is zoning. This is much, it affects everyone in the city, whereas the taxi franchises, that was a more uh, limited uh, issue, only affecting taxi franchises. This affects zoning really in the whole city. So uh, I would uh, look forward to closing the public hearing on the second reading, after the second reading. But I think there's gonna be some significant changes to uh, what we're gonna do on the first reading. There are gonna be some more debate, some more changes added. So because it's a zoning issue, I would, I would like to keep the, the hearing open and then after the second reading, close it at that point. Further debate on the amendment? Hearing none, those in favor of the amendment to keep the public hearing open, please raise your hand. Uh, for uh, uh, Houston, Zimmerman, Garza, and Tovo, those opposed to the amendment? Is the balance on the dais not passed? We are now uh, discussing the uh, motion to approve on first reading, close the public hearing. Is there further discussion? On this issue, Ms. Poole. I just wanted to um, say that I, I support item 96 and uh, that it is permissive in areas of town that already welcome ADUs. And the uh, Planning Commission notes in this um, resolution acknowledge that, I, well, and I want to acknowledge that while we're moving in other transit oriented directions, which I support, the reality is that people in Austin still drive cars, which is why we have the um, the requirement for at least one spot for a car to park. Um, I do support accessory dwelling units as a path to affordability, but not as vacation rentals, the type two STRs. So it's a complex issue for neighborhoods. I believe that the additional conversation that we'll have over time will be useful to inform the topic and that any additional changes to the ordinance, such as where it applies or the size of the lot should be handled really carefully to allow additional neighborhood feedback. Thanks. Well. Mayor, thank you. Um, you know, this has been the source of a, a lot of lively conversations over the last year or so, and I believe it took this long to come back to us because the Planning commi re Commission really wrestled with some of the more um, controversial elements of the proposal that had been that had been working its way through the process. And so, I think the Planning Commission, I believe, the Planning Commission recommendations that are before us represent a really good balance. I would say um, they do need a bit more work, and I concur with the comment that was made earlier by um, Susan Moffat that we really need to look at ways to discourage these, and I believe Stuart Hirsch brought this up as well, um, we need to really look at, at accessory dwelling units and make sure that they will not be used as short-term rentals and just prohibiting type two doesn't 
doesn't get to that. So I look forward to the committee discussions and also to some of the other considerations, whether, whether there can be an affordability component. But, but at a minimum, if we're going to loosen restrictions to allow for the creation of, of granny flats, of accessory dwelling units on, on more tracks, we need to ensure that they're going to be used for the purpose that has been cited, which is to create housing for people, not many hotels in people's backyards. Mayor. Yes, Mr. At, Andrea. At the neighborhood that had already adapted uh, secondary units, we call them granny flats. Uh, and, you know, I know that parking is a big concern, but all of our granny flats, we had no problem filling the driveway with a carport for our video, for for one vehicle. So I, I, I'm going to be supporting this because um, uh, I. It helped me out, you know, I was able to survive in my neighborhood because I was able to, you know, do a little, sometimes, you know, I was very careful, I'm one of those careful people about uh, vacation rentals and I, I don't rent my house, but, you know, I try to keep it under 14 days because, you know, uh, federal law allows you to rent your house for up to 14 days and you don't have to pay any income tax. and Usually, by south by southwest is when most people uh, in my neighborhood would rent it out. But there is a lot of people that have have brought in their their uh, their their mothers or their children, and they have two separate units, and and it's really helped those families out a great deal to be able to survive and live in the neighborhood where they grew up, and and uh, and they want their children to live there too. So. You know, it, it's it's a real positive thing, and I hope the people really look at that. That you know, it, it's a positive thing for Austin, especially for a lot of my uh, low-income families that live in East Austin, that they were able to stay there and survive, and and are, are doing, you know, uh, keeping our schools open. You know, there I have a family right across the street that built a granny flat in the back for their grandparents, and they're staying in the front with the kids going with small kids that are going to our schools. We have another one across the street that had doing the same thing. And they have five children, so it's a real positive thing to have these kind of families that are staying there and, and are surviving in our community. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a neighborhood, so I'll be supporting that. Any further discussion on the motion? Mr. Kassar. I'm really pleased that we're able to move on Planning Commission's recommendation on first reading because it sounds like of the variety of stakeholders we had, we had so many speakers all sign up in favor, but all with so many different opinions, but it was important to see that at least this was an important starting point of where everyone agreed. But uh, we do have some ways to go. Um, you know, the short-term rental issue uh, being brought up, the water submetering issue br being brought up, and if anyone else, I know I gave a bit of a litany of the issues we'll be addressing. I'll make sure to post that on the message board, and if anyone else has another issue they'd like to see addressed in those two committee hearings, we'll be happy to take it. Um, I do think that the that the lot size issue is, is an important one. Um, I understand uh, that there are neighborhood plans that opt in and opt out on that provision, but it's also important, I think, for this council to consider that um, many neighborhoods in high opportunity areas have opted out of having um, ADUs on smaller lot sizes. And in our own report we commissioned on fair housing choice, uh, experts did say that um, some of our lot size requirements and restrictions on ADU are impediments towards fair housing. And I just want to make sure that as we uh, make these sorts of changes that we are creating the sort of benefit um, not only for homeowners and uh, increased rental income stream, but also for the renters that um, could have the opportunity to live in those ADUs. So I look forward to, to working on uh, the easy parts and the hard parts in the months coming forward, but I'm glad we have at least some agreement here on the Planning Commission recommendation as a first step. Mr. Mayor, can I call the question? Yes, any further debate or discussion on this? Hearing none, let's just go ahead and take the vote. Uh, those in favor of the motion to approve on first reading closed public hearing, please raise your hands. Those opposed, uh, it is 10-1, Ms. Houston voting no.